I, I think what newsrooms have sort of come to realise over time is that the impact of online harassment and abuse can be really quite severe. It can have a serious impact on the health and well-being of individual journalists, that we, we know for sure. It can really cause a lot of stress and, and um, unhappiness and fear also. Um, but also it's reputationally can be very damaging to the, the, the newsroom itself. Um, if, you know, if, if an individual journalist is constantly being targeted, it can make the whole newsroom seem less trustworthy to the public. Um, and I, I guess because of that, it can also be seen as having an impact on the trust in journalism itself overall. So, it, so it, I think it's cut, newsrooms have come to realise that this is actually something they really need to do something about. I think the difficulty has been knowing what to do. And there's, there was quite a lot of, at first, I think, the feeling there would be a technical fix. You know, you've got a technological fix. Um, and to some extent, having, you know, there are tools that you can use that can help, but they're of quite limited value, I would say. I think what's more valuable is recognising that online abuse is a social and cultural problem, and so you need a, a cultural solution. I think it's really, really important that all journalists um, and all people working at the BBC feel it's okay to come forward if they have any concerns about um, how they're feeling about the work that they're doing or whether they're receiving any online abuse or anything else that's having an emotional impact on them. It's really important they feel it's that they can and should come forward and ask for help and they should report these things. Once it's been reported though, people know, need to know what to do with that. So there needs to be a system for reporting abuse and harassment. People know, need to know who to tell and that that person needs to know how to evaluate the risks that that individual is is being subjected to. So there needs to be a, a, a training around risk assessment and knowing what when does abuse and harassment tip over from being just unpleasant to being uh, potentially dangerous. I think everyone responds in different ways. So it's like one person may experience one particular attack from one particular individual that, if you like, gets under their skin and, and really, really upsets them. Someone else might um, receive quite a lot of, 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 of comments about them or about their work without it necessarily having a huge emotional impact until at some point it reaches a tipping point. So everybody's resilience levels, everyone's cup of tolerance is different. So I think we just need to um, uh, give people the space and the respect to, to express any concerns they have and not feel ashamed or guilty about expressing those concerns whatever the, whatever the um, reason or the cause is. Following on from that, I think once you've assessed the risk, you then have a better idea of what kind of support to put in place. And the support can be a very wide range of support structures. So it might be that um, it might be a very informal thing. So it might be that you have a chat group that's set up among the women journalists, for example, where they exchange experiences and support each other on social media if one of them is being attacked. That would be quite a straightforward thing. It might be in a bigger newsroom, you might have that as a much more um, like a sort of uh, well-organised peer support mechanism, you know, might be put in place where certain members of staff are trained to support others. Um, th then there are more formal methods of support like um, well, moderation, obviously, if you have an online platform and you're opening your stories up to comments, then you really need to have good moderation and those moderators need to be trained and they need to have good tools at their disposal. Uh, I don't have any scientific proof, but I have experienced myself from years of online communication that if you just engage there, you put your heart and soul into it for the good, that it kind of... Uh, creates this kind of atmosphere where those people who are perhaps not uh, there in order to have a sensible conversation who, or who are there to harass, they just feel unwelcome there. So they, they go and find another place, another Facebook page or wherever we are and, and, and pour their hatred out there. So it's kind of like... Um, uh, you have to constantly show that you care what is going on your platform. I think it's important for those people also who don't actually engage in the conversation there, but who are maybe perhaps just following what's going on there, to see that we as the media outlet actually do care about uh, 
the dialogue that is going on there. And we have to show that in every possible way. And then, and then you need to keep track of what is happening so that you can see if what, what you're doing is working, but also start spotting new trends as they happen. Because one of the things about uh, social media and online culture is it changes all the time. So it's, it, as soon as you found an effective way of, of stopping one thing, it will spring up somewhere else. So you've got to be, got to be um, always alert to new trends and so on. So if you're constantly tracking what is happening to your journalists, it means you're keeping up with the latest forms that these threats are taking.